Alrighty, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Looks like that. Um, so thank you so much for uh, coming to our session here. So we're going to be looking at web scale IT will change your world. Um, so before we kind of launch actually into the presentation, um, how many of you have actually heard of web scale or web scale IT? Okay, one. All right. <laughs> so the rest of you and some others in the back, I expect that. Yeah. Um, so we'll definitely kind of go through a journey and kind of talk a little bit about web scale IT. Um, the other things that we're going to go through is kind of look at operational maturity in general, um, organizational maturity, and, and where, where you're at in, from an IT perspective and kind of where you're at on that spectrum, and then how web scale IT can kind of intersect with that to help you move along that model of maturity. So we will go ahead and keep on going. So first off, a little bit about me and, and you know, why you should pay attention to me at all. Um, so I've been in the IT industry for almost 20 years now. Um, I am uh, uh, currently a systems architect at Nutanix. One of their 18 VMware certified design experts, also one of our nine Nutanix platform experts here at the company. Um, so just to kind of give you a, a perspective when it comes to what we've got at uh, Nutanix, um, when it comes to uh, certified design experts from a VMware perspective, um, out of the over, just a little bit over 200 of them in the world, um, we hold three times more than any other vendor outside of VMware, right? So when it comes to actually this particular um, expertise, there's a reason why um, there's been a mass um, migration to Nutanix. Um, I was the second VCDX there on staff. We're now at 18 and continuing to hire more. And the reason for that really is, you know, as a, a, a VMware certified design expert, my goal, right, and ultimately whenever I'm doing designs or architecture for any type of organization, whether this is, you know, enterprise or, you know, government, um, large or small, um, it really boils down to one thing, which is taking whatever the business requirements are and making that as simple as possible while still meeting those business requirements. And that's really why we've had an influx of VCDXs to Nutanix, is because as kind of visionary leaders in that space of design, um, we see that within the Nutanix product line and what Nutanix delivers from a solution perspective is really about simplifying the architecture and simplifying the infrastructure. Um, and this really comes down to web scale. And we'll talk about a little bit more about web, what web scale is and why that's important um, to the underlying architecture to help meet those requirements. All righty. So when we look at the role of IT today, right, really the business, when they're looking at IT, they really have one kind of agenda in mind, right, which is basically and kind of what we're talking about, meeting whatever the requirements are of the business as quickly as possible, right? They don't care about technology. They don't care about what widget it is underneath. You know, is it HP? Is it Dell? Is it who, whoever it is, right? They, they don't care, right? That's not what they care about. They care about applications. They care about data. Those are the two things that they care about from an IT perspective. And really, we need to be able to deliver that to them in a timely manner, in an efficient manner, um, with as little friction as possible, right? So that's really what, you know, the business sees from an IT perspective when it comes to this. So luckily, Microsoft has actually put together an operational model. It's called I.O. Um, for short. Um, it stands for um, Infrastructure Optimization. Um, and it's based on ITIL. And what they've really done is they've looked at um, the areas within an organization um, and where they are at in a maturity model and really how to take someone from a, if we look on the, the far left of the spectrum, uh, at a very basic nature, all the way to a dynamic organization. And really what that involves is, is three major you know, things, people, process, and technology. And so what we'll be focusing on is the technology piece for this, this presentation, but the other two are just as important, because if you don't get the other two right, it doesn't matter if you've got the right technology underlying, right? I've got to have the right people and the right processes in place to allow the technology to do what it needs to do. It's just an enabler for those other two things. So those other people and process are very, very important to this equation and definitely need to be taken into account. So as you're looking at these four different categories of, of operational maturity, um, I want you guys to, to actually spend some time thinking about this really quick. So we've got basic, right, which is really kind of a avoidance, right, and avoiding downtime. Um, IT is seen as a cost center, very reactive, very problem or interrupt driven. Right? Um, the next one up, standardized, right, it's, it's, I'm keeping the lights going, right, I'm keeping everything up and functional. Um, IT is still seen as a cost center. Um, it's just a, that black hole that money gets dumped into. Um, very reactive still, um, but a little more request driven, not so much interrupt driven and problem driven. Um, when we move into the rationalized model, right, we're looking at 
a more quality driven. This is where the, the business starts to see IT as an enabler of the business and, and that it's actually kind of more of a partner together um, to actually provide business value. Um, and it's seen as more proactive and starting to get more towards uh, standardizing and providing service level agreements back to the business so that there's, there's an understanding of what services are going to be offered and, and what that agreement level is and you know, what uptime and availability and performance are going to be associated with that. And then finally, we have the dynamic um, organizational operational maturity model, um, which is really taking the lead, right? This is kind of what we think of um, when you think of cloud or service providers, right? People that have something very, very automated, very, very um, standardized. Um, it's much more strategic in nature um, and becomes more proactive and much more agile, much more responsive to changes within the environment. Um, they can adjust very rapidly because they've got that process, people and technology in place and really honed really, really well. So when you look at these, and I, I, I want this to be interactive as well, so if you guys have questions, obviously feel free to ask me. Um, but I'd like to, to kind of hear from you guys, kind of where do you guys think you kind of honestly, <laughs> where do you guys think you, your, your department uh, lands? Where are you at in the organizational model? Who's going to be the first brave sold, actually? So you're in three, quality driven, rationalized, all right. Okay, between two and three, standardized and rationalized, all right. Anybody else want to be brave? Between two and three. Okay, two and three, fantastic. That's really good, actually. That's actually ph phenomenal. Um, most of the organizations I've worked for in the past, I've put between one and two. <laughs> when, when, I, when I honestly look at it, right, it's, it's one of those things where um, things were being done, you know, knee-jerk reactions. Um, there wasn't a lot of thought necessarily always put into things. We were just more you know, responding, right, rather than actually thinking ahead and actually trying to plan ahead of what, what the business needed, what it wanted, and be able to allow ourselves to be agile. What's that? Band-aid Yeah, right, exactly. It's, it's one of those things where you just keep putting things in place. A lot of times we do this with hardware, right? We'll throw hardware at a problem to mask it instead of actually looking at what's really going on and what the real problems are lying underneath and actually fixing the design or architectural issue. Um, and so that's definitely something that we've done in the past. I know I've done in the past, right, so. Definitely. So one of the other key things to, to note about this is that not only is this how you see your IT department functioning and, and working, this is how the business sees you, right? So the value that the business ascribes to IT is very much tied to where you are at in this model. Um, so definitely from a career path perspective and, and just, you know, um, successfulness in, in general and where we want to be, we want to be moving obviously towards, you know, the right, towards that more of that dynamic. So if we're sitting between three and four, that's a, that's a good place to be because trying to be at four all the time, that's really difficult. It's really hard. It's very challenging. Come on in. So diving a little deeper about what this looks like, look at a little bit of these and, and I, what I'm going to do at the end of the presentation is kind of map into web scale architecture and how web scale can actually help specifically in some of these particular areas, right? So when we look at a basic infrastructure, and actually we'll skip on the basic because we saw people mostly at two and three. So, you know, at, at a standardized architecture, we're looking at introduction of standards and policies, a little bit of automation associated with that, a little bit of medium touch throughout the infrastructure. There's, a, there's still a lot of manual operations going on um, when it comes to how we actually manage and maintain it. Um, the rationalized approach now, right? So now you're starting to see policies that are optimized and processes that are actually supporting the business. Again, that focus back on the business and not just, you know, again, being um, interrupt driven. Um, clear view of what they've got on inventory, what they have. Um, they've got some visualization into what's actually there within the architecture. Um, they're at that point where they buy only what they need, right? They're not spending three to five years out or over buying or over purchasing because they know what they need. They've, they've got a much more clear view into what's actually going on. And they've got an ability to scale. Um, so they're, they're not hairpinned by where they're at. They're gonna be able to take what they've got today and be able to grow that out um, without any complications or um, falling over at any point in time because the architecture underneath it doesn't support that. Then we look at the uh, dynamic, right? This is where infrastructures now help to, to effectively run the business. Um, it's, again, a much more tight um, uh, tie between the business. And so this is where, you know, because uh, when we look at our career paths and where we want to be, right, we want to see be seen as business enablers. That's what's going to get you um, moved up the chain as well, too. So anything you can do to focus to provide business value. Um, I know I'm a geek at heart, so it's hard because a lot of times I like to geek out on the tech and for the tech's sake itself. Um, but as IT folks, especially in this next five to ten years, 
there's a lot of the things that we've traditionally done that are going to go away. And so we really need to be doing ourselves a service and the business a service by focusing more on the business and less on the infrastructure, less on the technology itself, but how, how we can actually translate that technology into business value. That's really kind of where we need to, to be. We need to be those uh, mediators or ambassadors, if you will, to the business. Um, and, and then that, you know, speaking their language helps to be able to then translate that so that they, they know that they've been understood, they know that they've been heard, and that we're gonna provide that the resources that they need. So, what are some of the actual IT architecture challenges that we see out there today? Right? There's an overwhelming amount of complexity. Right? I, mean, I think we can all agree on this. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot that's going on underneath the covers. Um, when we're trying to deliver an application, there's a whole stack of infrastructure behind that application and its data um, to provide the, you know, the service level agreements that we want back to the business. And all those moving parts right, are all complicated. And depending where we are in that, you know, organizational maturity model, um, it may be more complicated, more cumbersome, more manual versus uh, more streamlined and actually functional within the environment. There's this inability to be able to grow incrementally and dynamically and expand elastically, right? This kind of idea of shrinking or growing, and we talked about SOA earlier, right? This, this idea that I've got this very elastic nature, I can grow or shrink um, as I need to, depending on what my needs are. Um, so we have a real lack of being able to do that very fluidly. Um, it's a lot of manual effort to make that happen. Um, and again, it kind of adds to that complexity. We keep adding islands of management in order to be able to make that happen if we talk about scale and moving things to scale. And so there's also the need to be able to be responsible or responsive and agile to the business. Um, and the problem is the underlying infrastructure traditionally doesn't allow for that. It's kind of what we're talking about, this whole idea of a lot of manual inter intervention, a lot of configuration, which really hinders that goal of agility. Um, you know, again, we want to focus less on the infrastructure, focus more on the applications, but it's really difficult to do that in our current environments because there's a lot again there's a lot of complexity there's a lot of domain skill sets that are required in order to deliver a single application to the business and then kind of lastly is the vendors traditionally and and you know out there in the ecosystem are putting the burden of security on the customer right the, a lot of a lot of them are requiring you to actually secure their products and to actually you know be in charge of that and they kind of leave that in your hands um, and so that's something that's really really difficult from that perspective, because now that's another burden that you have to take on to deal with compliance, to deal with auditing, and to deal with security. Um, and obviously in, in government, there's lots of different security concerns we have depending on the departments or agencies that we're actually a part of. So, to quote little Einstein here, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them, right? <laughs> Think about that, right? You know, we've dug this hole that we're in, right? Of, of not being able to be as responsive as we want to, not being able to be as agile, um, as scalable as we need to. And we can't kind of continue to do the same thing. We can't continue to do the status quo um, in order to be able to get out of this hole. We've got we to change our thinking. We've got to think differently in order to be able to solve these problems. So I'm going to tell you, <laughs> web scale is the answer to a lot of this. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So what is web scale? So, WebScale IT is basically an architectural approach um, that many of the large cloud providers have actually um, take, undertaken. So we look at the Googles, the Facebooks, Twitter, Amazon, right? And how they built out their data centers and be able to function in a very unpredictable and very changing environment. So you, you guys obviously aren't Googles or Facebooks, right? You're not at that scale. Um, California is definitely the large, one of the largest economies in the world. Um, so we do have a lot in comparison to other um, state um, government entities. But at the same time, right, there's, we're not at that scale, right? We're not providing those types of services or resources and those types of, of uh, service level agreements. We're, we're a, little, a little less, a little less intense. But at the same time, that same architectural approach, which gives the, them the flexibility that they need to be able to, again, dynamically grow or shrink, right? and respond to what's happening to be able to self-heal, uh, to be able to be secure by default, right, and not have those same types of issues and problems. 
um, and to have that level of automation and agility within the environment. Those are all things that we can actually take and incorporate in our businesses at whatever scale. It doesn't matter if we're very, very small or very, very large. Um, incremental consumption, right? I only buy what I need when I need it. I'm getting the latest technology at that point in time. The ability to start small and scale and grow without falling over. The ability to have a very simplified architecture, right, that I can manage and maintain um, with a very small level of, of admins. Um, when we look at a, a Google environment, right, a server to admin ratio, um, most typical virtual environments uh, are really good, kind of a, not necessarily dynamic, but maybe a level three organization, right? Those are about 300 or 400 to one. So for every admin, about 300 to 400 VMs, you, you're humming along pretty good. That's, that's a well, well optimized environment, and you're doing well. Um, in a Google environment, it's 10,000 to one, right? There's just a magnitude level of difference in what they're able to manage because, again, a lot of it's taken care of for them. The things that we focus on in our organizations, they're not having to deal with, right? They don't even have to focus on because it's all taken care of as part of the infrastructure. So one of the key principles of WebScale is hyperconvergence. So anyone want to take a stab at what hyperconvergence is? Love to hear. Who's heard of it, by the way, for example? Okay, we got one person, two persons, okay. Three people, all right. Oh, that, that looks like everything that's on my phone. Okay. Oh, well, you, wow. Imagine that, right? Yep. So very good. So basically what we're doing, right, we used to have all these devices. This is a great analogy for hyperconvergence, right? Hyperconvergence is basically looking at multiple tiers, at least two, could be more, and taking those tiers and consolidating them all down into one single appliance or, or, or platform. And so, you know, back in the day, and I'm dating myself here with the Walkman and the Daytimer, but I used to have all these, right? Some of you may have as well. And we all carried around all these special purpose devices. It was a piece of hardware, and it performed one thing. It was a phone, it was a watch, it was a calendar, you know, it was a music device, it was a flashlight, game player, right? Those are all single purpose. They had their own purpose that they had. Um, they did it well, and they did a good job of it, but I needed to have one of each of these in order to be able to have, you know, those, those skills or abilities, right? And so what happened, right, is we came out with the, the wonderful iPhone or Android platform. And what this did is this, this effectively was hyperconvergence. They took these devices, right, and, and changed the paradigm. And now I've got a single physical piece of hardware that's now actually all those individual devices that I had that were special purpose and tied to hardware are now decoupled from that hardware and are now in an application. They're now a software device. And so they've de been decoupled from their hardware. They no longer have reliance on that hardware. So now they're able to iterate those applications very quickly, very seamlessly, and provide the same level of performance and you know, capabilities that the original ones that had that were special purposely designed in hardware. And now we're able to do that very, very quickly, very rapidly, add new features and functionality um, all on one, one single platform or one device. So that's, that's really what we've got when we've got hyperconvergence. So looking at non-hyperconvergence. So this probably looks familiar to you guys as far as kind of an architectural or logical diagram of a, um, a virtualized environment, right? So we have servers at the top. So we've got, a, in this case, an HP Blade chassis. Um, you may have HP, you might have Dell, you might have you know, Lenovo, you might have you know, Cisco. Um, and a lot of people do have more than one vendor, right, when it comes to their data center, what they're managing. Um, there's also then the storage fabric itself. Right, and the components of that fabric, which could be multiple different devices and multiple different vendors as well. Um, backup DR replication type appliances. And then the devices that we actually have for our storage, right? And we might have a, you know, a VMAX for really high end, and then we've got you know, a VNX for mid range, and Isilon for file services, and I'm picking on EMC, but you know, this, this could come across all the different types of storage um, companies, right? Um, there's all these different platforms to provide different services each, right? which then needs to be monitored, right? So we've got to tie this all together. We usually have at least one, if not more, um, monitoring interfaces to be able to handle things like uptime, downtime. Um, is it you know, functional? Is it performance? Um, house capacity? All these types of things that we need to monitor within the environment. Um, and then each one of those individual systems has its own individual management interface, right? And we're talking Java version 1.6, 1.8, Flash, right? All these wonderful, horrible technologies that we love to have on our desktops to manage each one of these environments. Um, it's not fun, right? I, and I've been there in this space, right? I've managed these environments. Um, you know, trying to do updates of firmware or have any type of, you know, 
patch management cycle of regularity um, becomes a nightmare because now I've got a whole hardware compatibility list down this entire stack that I've got to manage, maintain, make sure it all works. So if I want to go to vSphere version 6, okay, well, does that work with the right HBA firmware, right? Or do I need to upgrade that? Um, what about the fabric? Is the fabric supported with that? Do I need to go to a new version of flare code on my um, EMC array? Um, what, what needs to happen to make sure that this is all going to be in line and everything's going to function properly? There's a lot There's a lot here, right? And so I've talked to people before where you talk about upgrading your environment, and that's a six- to nine-month operation to, to move forward, right? Because there's all these dependencies that we've got to deal with and, and deal with in place. Oh, and then we've got to stack the network on top of this and tie it all together, right? That's kind of an afterthought. Right? But it's all got to be interconnected, right? So there's just an overwhelming amount of complexity in this environment. So what if it could be different? Right? What if we could take this same environment and collapse it down using hyperconvergence to simplify? Again, take the, all those little different layers in the stack with different separate products, have a single product all built on HTML5 with a very nice UI. Doesn't require Java, doesn't require Flash. It's all backed by REST API, so there's a lot of resiliency. There's a lot of capability in the underlying environment to be able to tie things together within your environment. So speaking of software specifically, you guys are familiar with Tesla. Right? I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm waiting for Tesla 3 so I can finally buy a Tesla because I can't afford a Tesla Model S. But if we look at the Model S, right, and, and, and specifically, right, do we want to manage all these individual components that are all up here, all these different systems within the environment? No. People want to drive the car. That's the fun part, right? That's the part that we all enjoy. That's what we want to do, just like our, our um, counterparts in the business. They want to run applications of data. They don't, want to, they don't care about all the infrastructure and stuff that's lying underneath it. And so that's really what, you know, what we want to do. So when we look at this from a software perspective, um, specifically on Nutanix, this is a software-defined platform, right? So there's no reliance at all on, har on hardware. And so because all the intelligence is inside the software itself, um, it allows us to do some very amazing things. A, we're able to rapidly innovate, just like the iPhone, right, and just like applications. Able to come out with new iterations, new form, um, uh, features and functionality, um, new performance enhancements, um, all on the same hardware platform. Um, one of the things that we've been tracking across all of our different releases is about a 10 to 25 percent increase in performance with each major release on the same hardware. Right? I've got customers the same thing where, um, from a capacity perspective, um, at one point in time they had you know six terabytes of available capacity to them. Um, they got a new software feature release which in uh, included something like erasure coding, and now they've got you know double the amount of capacity that's available to them. Same hardware. Right? So there's something to be said for a software-defined platform where I'm no longer bound to or tied to that actual hardware underneath it. It gives us that flexibility. It gives us that agility. Oh, and by the way, all this stuff is actually done with a single click of operation when it comes to doing upgrades. So when I want to do upgrades to our software, upgrades to the hypervisor, upgrades to the firmware, it's all with one click with no disruption to the environment whatsoever. Right? So very seamless, very easy to be able to manage and maintain. And you can see some of the... the the other software feature sets underneath there, um, supporting multiple hypervisors, right? KVM, Hyper-V, VMware, supporting the ability to convert your entire workload from any one of those hypervisors, the ability to you know branch out to the cloud to be able to have cloud-based backup, the, the ability to have things like compression, deduplication, all that comes as a capability of the software itself. And so when we look at scalability and the ability to do incremental and linear scale out. Um, our platform is well suited to this. So just like the one-click upgrade functionality, adding a node is very incremental. I can add a node to the environment. I'm adding storage. I'm adding compute because it's all um, hyper-converged and together. And it's very predictable and linear. So this particular example that you're looking at and seeing here, this is actually um, looking at virtual desktops. Um, so if I'm running four nodes, which is what that one um, block down in the bottom left corner is, so there's four individual servers there. I'm getting 100 users per uh, node. Whenever I add another block or another four nodes, I'm now at 800. If I add another block of four nodes, I'm now at 1,200. And I can add no incremental nodes as, as a node at a time. And that's what the other little um, dots on the line are showing you. So with each node increase, I'm able to add another additional 100 desktops. Very linear, linear, very seamless. 
at no point in time falling over because of the actual architecture. Again, coming back to that web scale aspect and how Google and those guys build out their data centers, it's all distributed data across the entire platform, all localized processing, all localized I.O. Right? So because of that, we're able to continue to add nodes to the environment and scale that out without any um, degradation. Um, our largest customer is well over 2,100 nodes. Right? So we can definitely do large scale. So also with the, in the system is security, right? which is usually an afterthought. So within security, most of the time when, when people think about it, it's, it's a bolt-on. Right? It's something that actually comes after the fact. Um, so something that we've done, we've actually got what's called our insert team. Um, our Nutanix uh, security um, engineering response team. And so what they do is they actually work with engineering as we're releasing code releases. And so security is a fundamental aspect within the system that's built in as part of the culture. And I know there's, this is kind of a, a wordy slide and there's a lot there to read. But basically what this is talking through is, is it allows us to be able to be responsive to things like zero day threats because we're analyzing the code before it's actually going out the door to making sure that it's, it's compliant with whatever release um, uh, CVE vulnerabilities that we've already seen in the environment, that that's already attached to there, and allows us to be able to innovate much more quickly and be much more responsive. The other thing that we've actually uh, approached with this is this idea that we want to make sure that we have a hardened appliance model. So again, something shipping out of the door is already hardened by default, right? It's already secure by default. Um, and then within that, right, as we continue to um, journey along, because security is a journey, it's not a destination. Um, you know, you never get there. <laughs> there's always uh, new exploits, there's always new things that are gonna be coming out, so it's never finished or completed. And so what we continue to do is, is as we continue to release code and as we continue to find vulnerabilities, we make sure that that gets um, completed within the product itself. And then also we finally make it easy for you to be able to deal with auditors and auditing, right? So we wanna make sure that, again, taking off the burden on you, you shouldn't have to deal with the compliance burden. That should be on the vendor, right? It should be the vendor's responsibility to make sure that they're shipping a secure product, not on you. Um, and you should also have the ability to easily audit that and easily you know, present that information to an auditor and, and, and be able to see at any one point in time what the security posture of your system is and how it's actually functioning. So tying this back into to web scale and back into the operational maturity model, right? How can, how can web scale help in some of these areas? Because as I mentioned, it's people, process, and technology. So it's not everything. It's not the panacea, but it is the technology aspect of it. So manual or complicated infrastructures, we simplify the infrastructure, right? We, we give you your time back. I've got admins that do updates in the middle of the day at noon. They go away. I've got a customer up in the Pacific Northwest. They have 160 nodes. On Friday at noon, they decided to upgrade their entire 160 nodes. So they just said download, they said click to upgrade, they went off to lunch. 45 minutes later, they came back, their environment was upgraded. Right? You imagine what you do from your day-to-day day -day experience today and getting your time back, getting your weekends or evenings back so that you're not, again, babysitting that infrastructure that, that's taken care of um, and done for you. Um, we've got insight into the health of the environment so that you actually can see what's going on and how it's actually performing, how it's actually, um, what the health of the environment is so that you're not guessing on how it's actually going to be. Um, these are not lining up the way they're supposed to, so apologize about that. So light automation, right? So we bring in automation into the framework. I mentioned that everything that's um, backed in the UI is backed by REST APIs. So anything is programmatically capable to be able to be uh, worked with with other, other third-party products or to automate or pull into your own um, individual dashboard. I have one uh, Fortune 500 customer that's actually doing everything completely with REST APIs and their own interface. They don't actually go into our interface at all. Um, they've got their own dashboard they built and they do REST API calls out to us to manage the entire infrastructure. So buy what you need when you need it, right? Again, you're getting the right technology at the right time. So it's, you know, it's really ridiculous to spend for three and five years out. It's like taking the best laptop, sticking it in your closet, and leaving it there for three years, and then pulling it out after three years and going, oh, great, now I can finally use this. This is what we do with our infrastructures, right? It's, it's ridiculous, right? We should be only using that technology at, when we need it, right? There's no reason to be overbuying and overprovisioning, especially not when it's as easy to be able to scale and easy to be able to increment this environment. So costs are, are controlled and predictable, right? I'm able to really understand how things are, are put together and where things are going. 
and then the infrastructure investments yield specific rapid and measurable results, right? I'm able to take this infrastructure that was very complicated, cumbersome, and manual and transition this into a very agile, very responsive um, to the needs of the business. So we're really on a journey to make in infrastructure invisible. That's really where we're going from a Nutanix perspective. So what we've done already, right, we've made storage invisible. The ability to think, think about how you guys provision storage today, LUNs, LUN masking, zoning of the fabric, carving that up, presenting that back up to the hypervisor, that's all done. RAID groups, those are all, it's literally I give it a name and click create and it's done. Right? And, that, and, that's, and that's all I have to do. That's my single point to be able to run all my virtual environment. We've made virtualization invisible, right? So now with our Acropolis hypervisor that we've included it, we've included virtualization within the stack and we've taken the management plane and distributed it across all the nodes, making it highly available by default. I'm making it easy so when I stand up a cluster, um, my virtualization management solution is already there. I'm not managing a database. I'm not managing other things associated with it. It's already built in as part of the product. So when I do upgrades, that's all built in, right? It's all, all one piece, all one puzzle. And then our next goal of this is making cloud invisible. And so this is where we're really headed. And so over the next year, you'll start to see a lot more of this coming. Um, today we have backup to the cloud as part of our platform. Um, but really what we're going to be doing is, is merging the public and private cloud, that hybrid cloud that you've been hearing about. Um, we have our one place to be able to manage both of those within there. So things like being able to run workloads in either location, making a business decision about where I may run my workloads, but allowing IT the control to be able to know where everything's done. It's not shadow IT where people are going outside and around IT because IT can't deliver. This gives you the capability to be able to deliver that for them so that they're able to actually manage that and maintain that. That's where we're going. We'd like to have you guys along here with us. So any questions? Well, we got a backpack that's associated with questions, so I better have at least one good question. See the wheels turning. Gave you guys warning ahead of time. So this is basically <laughs> a uh, suite of software that provides APIs in, into all this automation. So what it really is, and thank you for clarifying that. So really what it is is an appliance model. So it's a bundling of both software and hardware. And we, we need hardware to make this happen. We're agnostic to the hardware you leverage and use. Um, so today that can be done on Supermicro. It can be done on Dell. It can be done on Lenovo. And so we've got OEM relationships with all those different vendors to run the Nutanix software because that's really what it is. It's software that's running in a VM in that architecture that's providing those services, storage-related services, hypervisor-related services, and that management overall, right? And all that's, again, backed by REST API. So programmatically speaking, anything that I want to do within the system to manage the infrastructure can be done via those REST APIs. But there's also a UI. So if you're not a programmatic guy and you're like, I, I don't want to, I'm that scared right, of programming, we make it very easy for you within the UI to be able to do and manage what you need to be able to do. So whether I'm more on the service provider side of things and more cloud-like and I want to have that ability to automate and script and provision, um, or if I'm you know, kind of just down here of I'm the one-man IT shop and I just need it to run, we've got you covered on either one of those. It's a good question. Just another question back here. Uh, oh, yes? We'll judge and see who, who has the best one. Question? Yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to do the uh, provision, and uh, now you combine everything together, make things easy. Yes. However, if they change, they have to be temporary change. Okay? Like what kind of change? And for example, if you base on um, some kind of hardware, then the hardware is in the change. Okay, perfect. So one of the things that we can do is we can interoperate and intermix hardware within the same cluster. So a, a Nutanix cluster is a, a, an association of hardware resources. We can mix and match different hardware models. So like, for example, we have one model that's a storage only model. It doesn't actually run virtual machines at all, but it provides capacity. So if I've got like a great need for, like I just gotta have a bunch of capacity. I really don't need any compute. I don't need, really need to run a bunch of VMs. I just need capacity. I would add in that model into the environment, which would expand my capacity overall, um, but also provide in additional processing for that storage. 
Um, I've got other models that do things like GPU offload. So if I want to do virtual desktops with CAD CAM, right, I can have specific models that are going to be tied to leveraging that for GPU offload. And so I can intermix and intermatch those within the same cluster and allow my workloads. I can do pinning or move workloads around to make sure they're getting the right resources. Um, the other thing that we do really, really well is just pool and aggregate those resources. So one of the things that we're very, very good at is taking software algorithms to do things that we used to have architectural, you know, we used to have to do this kind of thing, right? We'd make things work um, by, you know, putting in and stitching all these things together. Um, but what we've done now is take things like, so like our tiering, for example. So we tier between um, flash and between spinning disk within our architecture. They're both persistent tiers of storage. Um, but by default, we run all of the active working set of data within the flash tier and then automatically migrate that down into the um, cold tier uh, based on timing. And if it's automatically accessed, it's automatically up promoted back into the, the hot tier and then can also be cached with inside of memory too, depending on how many times it's being touched. And so that's all transparent to you. Right? When, when you look at the system, you just see a big pool of storage. Right? But that's all happening to make sure that we're you know, actively giving you know, the VM or the workload the performance that it needs and it requires based on its active working set of data. So there's a lot of things that are done under the covers from a software algorithm perspective to prevent you from having to make architectural decisions. Right, it, and it depends on, on exactly what the business change is and what, what, what's happening there. Um, so a lot of times the, the resources, right, we've got, when, it, when we talk about infrastructure, we've got, you know, networking, disk, compute, you know, CPU and memory, right? So those are the core four resources that we have for any application, right, to be able to, to run and reside. And so that's just a matter of a design of the architecture to make sure that I'm writing them, right. that's my job as an a solutions architect, right, is to do that and work with customers to make sure when we size this out, are we sizing it appropriately to that? And so if we need to make changes within the environment, so like, so if you needed to shrink that, right, I can remove nodes from the architecture to shrink over time. Um, also things like migrations, right, so take for an example of someone that starts with a four node cluster um, and three to five years down the road, they're like, hey, we're ready to upgrade to a newer hardware, we've got newer initiatives and we need to change and shift the direction a bit. I can add four new nodes to the architecture, to the cluster. It'll automatically balance the disk across all eight nodes. I'll then remove the old four nodes. I can reprovision them somewhere else or decommission them completely. And all the data gets balanced across the new, four new nodes. Right, so you think about things like data migration and when, whenever you do like a SAN upgrade and the, you're doing a forklift upgrade with that, that's a robocopy, that's a manual process. Right, so storage vMotion, you're, you're manually having to intervene to get all that data off the old and onto the new. We don't, we don't do that. It completely rebalances and then reestablishes itself on the new architecture. So we make it a lot more seamless to be able to do any types of moves, adds, or changes that you need to do in the environment. Do you utilize multiple VMs for doing this? Is that how you scale? To it is. So, so every, every node in the architecture is running what's called our controller VM. Our controller VM runs all of our services. So our metadata um, database, our configuration database, our disaster recovery replication, our user interface, if it's our own hypervisor, our hypervisor management interface, all those services are running inside of that controller VM and there's one per node. So every time I'm adding a node, I'm adding additional services, I'm adding additional processing for the storage underlying it, I'm adding additional, if it's the hypervisor management, I'm adding additional hypervisor management capacity. Um, and so the benefit of that is we never fall over, right? Because every time we're adding that out, even though we're scaling this out and growing it, because everything stays localized, right? I'm keeping everything localized to the system, but yet also distributing at the same time. So it, you get those economies of scale when you bring that out and blow that. And yes. I mean, that's the beauty of web scale. It is. So infrastructure Very much so. Right, so this is this is a virtualized computing platform, if you will, right? So really what this is is, is you know, a data center in a box. And if you want to think from that perspective, from a computing perspective. So, so anything that's supported for that hypervisor. So everything is, is a virtualizable workload today. Um, actually, shortly, we're going to be coming out with block services that will allow you to attach 
external storage to a physical system. Um, today, though, as it stands right now, it's all it's all virtualized workloads. So, um, for VMware, um, for Hyper-V, or for um, KVM, it's whatever the supported guest OS is and the supported applications that underlie that. So. That's your standard stack. So like for our Acropolis hypervisor, for example, um, we're on the Microsoft server validated virtualization platform. So all Microsoft OSs, all Microsoft products like Exchange, SharePoint, SQL, those are all supported. Oracle doesn't care, um, right? It's more about the OS for Oracle. So as long as you're on a supported OS for Oracle, I can run. Um, but I'm not going to be running like AIX or anything. I might run Solaris on x86 kind of a thing, um, but I can't run any type of um, Unix specific platform that's looking for risk processing, right? This would all be Intel x86 based um, systems that would run. How about Splunk? Have you right. So those are all different types of workloads that are capable of running within the architecture. So when we talk about databases, VDI, disaster recovery, security, Splunk, unified communications, right? These are all potential um, targets for us that we have customers running. Well, yeah, almost definitely. And so and we've got, like I mentioned, our, our largest customer is well over 2,100 nodes. They're running a big data project. It's a Hadoop project on that one. Um, but we have Fortune, you know, 50 customers that are running SQL, SAP, right? So definitely from the enterprise space, we definitely fit within all those categories all the way down to the, you know, the small business that's running, you know, file print and DHCP. So that's still on top of whoever the Oracle admin or the SQL admin is. They would handle the patching of the OS. We don't. No, no, that's 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 up to you know WSUS or something or SCCM from a Microsoft perspective or Red Hat Satellite Network or Oracle, right? Whoever the DBA is, they would patch the database. So they're still in control of of those aspects of the system. We don't play there. We play. Yes. So coming back to the infrastructure as a service, that's really what that is, right? That's where the, the de line of delineation. And I'm sorry, because you, you were patient. <laughs> Can you also, um, within your uh, system, virtualize uh, routing services? Sure. So like NSX is supported, right? So that's one of the options um, on our platform. So if you wanted to run NSX Road from a software we're partners with F5, with Citrix for NetScaler, right? So all those are, are definitely capabilities to be able to run within the system. Anything in the networking stack. Um, and, and some of that's more feature rich dependent on the hypervisor, right? So like hyper, um, vSphere specifically has a little bit more, you know, edge off the other two when it comes to the actual networking stack and some of the capabilities they have available. Um, Acropolis will be very, very close behind that as far as that's concerned, but that's definitely a, an area where, where VMware specifically shines in that. Yes, ma'am. Is there any restriction or constraint? Sure. <laughs> this, this is really important to me, so. Sure. Um, so there definitely are constraints. Um, the constraints are going to be based on certain things. So most. When it comes to things like performance, um, there are very few applications. I'd say probably 1% or 2% of the applications out there that that wouldn't play nice. I mean, like really ultra low sensitivity, low latency sensitive applications, like maybe trading applications or something like that, where we're dealing with microseconds of latency that are required for those types of transactions. Um, there could be there's constraints when it comes to the uh, hypervisor itself and the cluster size, right? So I want to think. Uh, this is just an architectural, you know, um, conversation to have of fault domains, um, on how I want to carve out my fault domains, um, because just because we can scale to 2,000 nodes in a cluster, that's probably not the best thing, right? Because you're going to have disk drives fail, nodes will fail, right? And so I want to isolate those failure domains. And so usually, what it comes down to is a rack becomes a failure domain. Um, for vSphere, it's 32 or 64 um, hosts per cluster is their limit from, from uh, their cluster perspective. So we're obviously limited by the hypervisor um, and with whatever constraints that they have on their system. So there definitely are um, constraints that are associated with that. And it's going to depend upon, again, the application that we're running and what's actually going on to determine what those would be. Any questions? <laughs> 